You're listening to part two of our conversation with Richard Rohr about his book, The Universal Christ. If you haven't heard part one yet, just go back in your podcast feed. It's sitting there waiting for you. Uh, But for now, go ahead and listen to this piece by our friend Pete Holmes about his life experience with Richard Rohr. Hi, Liturgists. This is Pete Holmes answering the question, how has Richard Rohr revealed the universal Christ to you? Um, Obviously, uh, Richard is a piece of the universal Christ, just like me and just like his dog, Venus. (laughs) By the way, in his book, the only dedication to a book that made me cry uh, when he talks about his dog who passed being the Christ to him as well. Um, That is a good book. If already on page one, your heart is opening and uh, being revealed new ideas and more open, more open place space. You know what I'm saying. Uh, But the first place that I found Richard talking about it was on a YouTube video called The Catholic Corner. Uh, It only has about 170,000 views. I think I'm 70,000 of them because I watch this video once a month, at least, uh, over and over. I reference it constantly on You Made It Weird because this is where Richard first introduced me plainly to the idea that Jesus, uh, his last name was not Christ, that Jesus became the Christ and that the Big Bang was the birth of the Christ. I've said that dozens and dozens and dozens of times on my own podcast because it was an idea that I felt and certainly could intuit, but Richard gave that, as he always does, that difficult and kind of big idea, he gave it plain language. And that is something I'm so grateful to him for. And then The Universal Christ, the video came out in 2011, all these years later, is the book version of that idea of light being the universal constant and and just so many things that have changed my life. The Universal Christ is far and away my favorite Richard Rohr book. I'm tearing through it. And that is saying a lot, seeing as his books have, have radically changed my life for the better. Um, So I highly recommend it. It's incredible. So I found it first in a YouTube video and then again through his other writings. And now I read The Universal Christ to my five-month-old baby every morning because it doesn't matter what you read to a baby. She just licks the back of the book and she thinks it's delicious. And so do I. Where does that leave hell? Oh, boy. Okay. (laughs) We do have a CD on this, uh, auspiciously (laughs) called Hell No. For our listeners, a compact disc is an (laughs) old form of optical media that contained audio. I'm going to give you the summary, though you don't need to buy it at all. Uh, There's not a religion in the world that doesn't have some notion of non-cooperation, resistance, And do you see, let's connect this with what we said before about freedom. You have to. You have to say and preserve the possibility of saying no to this gracious universal invitation. If you don't preserve that possibility, then you and I are robots. So even Buddhism, in fact, in some ways more than us, talks about hell. The only trouble is we took the metaphors especially used by Matthew. Uh, They are in other places. I'm not denying that. But Matthew, I always say he had a punitive upbringing (laughs) (laughs) because he loves to end with a threat. He He just loves. (laughs) So true. He'll say, Matthew 25, and I'm reading it dramatically at the altar and all the people are, you know, love the least of the brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And then... I read the last line, you know, and they're just all struck with PTSD, you know. (laughs) Those of you who don't do this will burn in the everlasting fire. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, it just undoes the whole message. Mm. It really does. But it's an effective way up to now that teachers have taught. You have to present the alternative in language that is both urgent and ultimate. Mm. Urgent and ultimate. And so it became the language, the iconography, the symbolism of that God would respect that no as long as you persist in it. That gave it a notion of eternal hell. Mm -hmm. And even, I'm sorry to say, eternal torture. And when that's planted in the lower brainstem, like it was in me, 
especially those of you who were raised Christian, mm -hmm. you first heard those stories as a little whatever. <laughs> That's why I think when I see the irrationality that people hold on to their notion of hell and their fighting words, especially evangelicals, yeah. don't take away from me my hell. <laughs> and, I, and, and you want to say, why, why are you so attracted? And they say, I believe in hell. And I say, it, I try to say it kindly. Do you realize what you just said? Mm. You believe in hell? <laughs> Is it perhaps you're taking delight? Mm. Why are you so attracted to this? Well, with the normal dualistic mind, you know how I get everything back to dualism and non-dualism, maybe too much. We like the win-lose frame. It appeals to the dualistic mind. Good guys, bad guys. Win-win doesn't appear just. Wow. As, as long as you're still involved in the dualistic mind. It, it, up to now, we've framed almost the entire gospel, even though Jesus lays no ground for this in retributive notion of justice. The fact that the word restorative justice didn't even appear till 30 years ago, something like that, you know, shows we didn't have a mind for it. Not in Western culture. In Western, yeah, yeah, very well said, yeah. I checked this out with Walter Brueggemann, who's my favorite Old Testament uh, scripture teacher. And I said, is it fair to say that all the prophets in the Bible eventually get to restorative justice. He said almost every single one. Wow. But here's, here's the rub. Before you get there, they've wasted 30 chapters on retributive justice. <laughs> and that lodges in your brain stem. You, Yahweh is going to th do this to you. Yahweh, it's all punishment and wrath. And so I can't blame the evangelicals. For put, put, I swear they have the word wrath in every third <laughs> song. I, why are they so attracted to that word wrath? Well, if you just read the prophets in a cursory sense, it is there. Uh, the example that's easy to use is Habakkuk. You know, mm. three chapters of tirades and accusations. and God, But wait, the last three verses of Habakkuk. Read it sometime. You probably have. Brueggemann calls it the great nevertheless. Wow. The great nevertheless. He gets to the last three verses. He says, nevertheless, I will raise you up with uh, hinds feet on high places. And it's poetically and beautifully put. But you have to struggle through all the rest. To get to. <laughs> the the where, place where it's most directly taught is a chapter I'm sure you're more familiar with, Ezekiel 16, where uh, the dry bones, and then the final paragraph, at least in my Bibles, he uses the word, I will restore you, I will restore you, I will restore you, six or eight times, you know, hmm. after a series of threats. So it's almost a, a parable about how the human mind works. I think the human mind does begin with dualistic, quid pro quo, good guys, bad guys. Look at young boys' attraction to sports <laughs> it's, and, and to business. Those are the explainers of meaning left in Western society, yep. business and sports, because they clearly operate on the win-lose Yep. Paradigm, you see, <laughs> which created capitalism. People can't even imagine. You know, when I write my daily meditations, I get more pushback if I cri criticize capitalism, yep. even than white privilege and nationalism. Mm. Oh, my God, the hate letters come yeah. in. And I said, how can you have read me this long and still be so hateful toward <laughs> or so protective? Of, of capitalism, as if this fell from heaven in a glad bag, as God's... Supply side Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let me tell you a personal story. Bono told me when he visited the Pope last time, they met in a side room. He wasn't even on the official list of 
visitors to Pope Francis because they wanted to talk just honestly. And he told me this. He said, Richard, you know, I criticize capitalism. But he said, I found myself defending it from Pope Francis. He said, he's farther left than I am. <laughs> <laughs> he, says, he can't say most of these things. It would divide the church, you know. But he said, Let it be. he's seen what capitalism has done to the poor. It just year by year makes the rich richer. Now, I'm not saying, don't hear me dualistically, that capitalism has not done some good things. Let's all agree to that. Yeah. It really has. done some, So don't think I'm throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But maybe it, I'd be better to speak of rigid capitalism. Now, why am I talking about this now? Because that's the frame in which we understood the gospel. Win, lose. Reward, punishment. And as long as you stay there, you need big threat of eternal punishment. But the, the major bad effect of that is God the Father, as we historically call the Creator, became for many people, and I mean this sincerely, a very unlikable figure. He, if he would demand blood from Jesus before he could love his own creation, forgive the masculine pronouns, but that's how it was conceived at that time. And, of course, from my men's work, I'm aware of how many people had abusive fathers, alcoholic fathers, fathers killed in war, emotionally unavailable fathers. So once that word father got polluted, we just filled it with yes. And I think, I hope this doesn't offend you, I suspect that's why we overplayed, allow me to say it, the Jesus card. Because we didn't have Trinitarian theology anymore that the relationship between the Father and the Son in classic language was not uh, love. Hmm. It wasn't love. So you've destroyed the Trinity at that point. And that's why I say in my previous book that most Christianity is non-Trinitarian, which means its, its fault lies at the very foundation. Its foundational worldview is not relational, it's monarchical. Yeah. <laughs> It's, and it's male monarchical, which we call patriarchy, of course. So this whole capitalist world and this male power world just work together pretty well. So uh, all that's an attempt, and I know it's only an attempt, to respond to your good question about how hell emerged. But as John Sweeney says in his marvelous book on the subject Certainly we see after Dante's Divine Comedy and da Vinci and Michelangelo's art, we see that it was that notion of hell as a place of eternal punishment. Once you get into punishment, you're in trouble. <laughs> because once God is punitive, and let me give us our exit clause from that, is the ministry of Jesus. It's why the concrete is so important. The, the reason, in my opinion, <laughs> that we have so many healing stories, healing stories, healing stories, healing is the opposite of punishing. Mm. Healing is the opposite of excluding. See, evil was normally excluded, like the man tied up in the cemetery, you know. Evil was normally punished. We see no, Jesus punishes no one. So it's the best argument for restorative justice we have, really. Simply the healing ministry of Jesus. And yet, and here I would congratulate the Pentecostals. You know, it was really the Pentecostals who brought back to Christianity the notion of healing. The very notion of it. Praying over people, touching people. And, and I saw it happen, that there's, there's love energy in the body. You can't control it. You can't predict where it flows, but it does flow. Mm. And it flows outside of our control. We'd see, you know, bad people be healed instantly and sweet little holy people just sit there with their eternal arthritis or whatever it was, <laughs> you know. The dialogue can become too theoretical. I believe in hell. I don't believe in hell. But just point out the ministry of Jesus. 
He didn't teach via threat. Now, he did describe consequences. If you do this, you're killing yourself. You heard me say in the book, we are punished more by our sins than for our sins. Uh, and that Jesus describes. You do that, and you're going to suffer. <laughs> it's close to the, what the Eastern religions call karma. Huh? Very close to it, really. Your comment makes me think about one of my favorite quotes about healing, which is, say that healing is to touch with love that which was touched by fear. Oh, that's nice. Hmm. That's beautiful. You know, I learned that my years in the jail, these people, I didn't even want to go in and meet because I read about them in the Albuquerque Journal, the evil things they did. And when I'd go to the private cell, and spend time with them. There, I can't think of a single individual that I couldn't recognize had been touched by fear, abuse, rejection, and your, your heart space would just open. This isn't someone to hate. This is someone to pity, and I mean that in a positive way, not a patronizing way. And, you know, they evoke your heart, the pity of your heart. You're so trapped, and how can we get you out of that trap? And what you just said is the way. They need to be touched by an unconditional love. So all this conversation about mind makes me want to address something that you wrote in the book. I'm a, I'm a scholar, academic. Some of my training has been to use my mind actually to help other people good, heal good. their minds. Good. <laughs> and to heal my own mind yes. as well. Um, and but Jesus I, did say, love the Lord your God with your uh -huh. mind. Yeah, yeah, good. Go ahead. I want to talk about mind as distinct from some other thing that you're referencing, although I recognize the paradox of that, that that kind of acknowledges some sort of dualistic notion of being. But I found it interesting in the beginning of your book that you prefaced it by cautioning the reader that insights to quote mm. you will yeah. remain partially mysterious, at least for a while, end quote, and... Quote, I know this can be dissatisfying and unsettling to our egoic mind, end quote. But then you try to integrate science and psychology to support anyway, your insights. Yes. <laughs> so there's this like, leave, kind of, leave the sense making of this or, the, or the, perhaps the need to figure it out to yes. later. But yeah. then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in mind to try and maybe support my arguments or convince you. And, and so I'm wondering about what role intellect or thinking has in the work of Christian mysticism wow. or in your work as well. Lovely. Is there room for the mind? And, and how do we engage the mind in a way that doesn't allow the ego to take over? Take over. My, what a good, good question that whatever I say won't be adequate. Oh. It is the Achilles heel of a lot of Protestant denominations and Catholics too, for that matter. We tried to integrate the mind, but we did it in such a rational way that it brought about its own pushback. Let me begin with this. I don't know if it's the best place to begin. I believe the biblical concept of faith, and the very word is still held on this meaning, is the balancing of knowing with unknowing. <laughs> to such a degree that you can live peacefully and happily without full knowing. But what you're saying rightly is we still need some partial knowing, some partial evidence. I don't think it's a blind leap of faith. And that's where science, uh, philosophy comes in to be helpful. Now, a lot of people don't need that, but more and more people in the modern world do, do need that ability to know. I'm sure you're familiar with St. Anselm's uh, definition of theology. Faith, seeking an understanding of itself. That's theology. Faith is the given, the leap, into trusting that God is good, and this is all going somewhere good, and I'm good. Those are the three theological virtues. But then knowing that I, I can't fully prove that, I don't every day fully experience that, but I have enough light to absorb the darkness. That's the walk of faith, just that there's a lot, enough light. So I think that should be, ideally, the meaning of morning prayer. I, people ask me, how long should I pray? And I say, pray as long as it takes you to get to an, 
a yes, Mm -hmm. a yes of some kind. This is good. That tree is beautiful. That sky is blue. The sun is lovely today. There's something felicitous at work. There's something benevolent that I'm a part of. If you begin with no again, it's that beginning with a problem. So pray till you can get to yes. Then you will have the capacity, the largeness of soul, the humility of mind. And that's what it amounts to in the mind, humility. To not insist on total knowing. All knowledge is imperfect, as Paul says in Corinthians. I think it's academics and and all of us who are educated, we need humility. I think maybe uh, other people need courage more, or, or the ability to let go or to trust. So you know the big words for this, for a spirituality that was based on words and knowledge and concrete experience was called the cataphatic tradition. That which was based on silence and symbol and darkness. And that's much, 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 much weaker in the Protestant tradition. Why? Because by the 16th century, we were all fighting for knowledge (laughs) to prove ourselves against the Enlightenment universities of Europe and America. And so after the 16th century, you pretty much have the death of the apophatic tradition. Now the two great symbols of that, I'm sure you've heard the names, would be Pseudo-Dionysius, who isn't Pseudo at all. Thomas Aquinas, the great rational Catholic teacher, you know the person he quoted more than anybody else? Pseudo-Dionysius, because he's still respected the apophatic tradition. And the other one that you might be more familiar with, 14th century England, is the cloud of unknowing. And that's a little more readable. So uh, that's in great part what evangelical Christianity is trying to regain. And without it, this lust for certitude, this insistence on light and total light is actually the sin of Adam and Eve, you know. (sighs) picking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know who's going to heaven. And we're absolutely certain. We're certain gays are going to hell. Well, isn't that wonderful? You have the mind of God. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's so arrogant. Mm -hmm. And and our little denominations, we, we never really condemned you Protestants to hell, but we did feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> we did, because we knew we were the one holy Catholic true church, and you were all heretics who had left us. And, you know, everybody looks out from their vantage point and their reference point, which is called group egotism, isn't mm. it? And it's more dangerous than individual egotism. I am convinced, and of course it's been happening for 80 years now, that science is emerging as one of our very best partners for giving us metaphors and frames inside of which we can even better understand the work of God. You know, things like quarks and black holes, what, 95% of the universe is is darkness and is black holes or invisibility or space. It isn't particles. It's the space between the particles. And it's that pull between those that where the energy comes from. It sounds very Trinitarian to me, but I know I'm reading everything theologically. So um, for those who've learned quantum physics, molecular biology, really understand the almost impossible mystery of the human body, how it continues to work day after day. They aren't our enemies anymore. They're our friends. You speak of the soul sometimes. I'm curious about what the soul is in your view. Well, again, here's where science 
really gives us a quite wonderful metaphor, DNA. The inner holding together of the essence of a thing and that everything comes out from that essence and is replicated in different forms in the larger body. We call them seeds in some of history. Bio. So every science is going to have a different metaphor that things tend to have an inherent beginning point or meaning point. Or, and we call it in the human psycho or human spirituality, I guess, the true self, the core, the foundation, the untouchable, the discovery of that and the honoring of that, the soul of everything, might be even called the heart of spirituality. When you can honor the soul of a thing, uh, the way I usually say it is, when you meet things subject to subject, not, as Martin Buber would put it, subject to object. Uh, you know, one of the great things about, about this Me Too movement has brought forth is this recognizing by women, and I hope by some men, that men have been allowed for centuries to objectify the body of a woman and that women are coming to that sense of their inherent dignity. No, you may not do that. Huh? I will not allow you to do that. God, that's a sign of an evolution of consciousness, it seems to me. But we, we've done that with everything, you know? So once you accept that the meaning of life is subject-object, what we found is it moves to everything. Not just animals, not just trees. You know, when I joined the Franciscans, in 1961, we were reading all of our expectations, requirements, and rules as a Franciscan. And the one that shocked all of us was, you may not cut down a tree without the permission of your major superior. Major is not the house superior, not the local superior, but the head of the whole province. Now, that might sound legalistic to you, but do you see what they were doing? giving tremendous, you don't cut down a tree lightly. You don't just cut down a tree because you feel like it. You have to write a letter <laughs> to your provincial. <laughs> How brilliant Francis held on for eight centuries. But isn't that beautiful that that I-thou relationship, we tried to maintain it by idle symbols in a way. But uh, Western capitalism has almost completely lost it. The profit motive justifies everything, which is the objectifying of everything. Mm. Mm. So mm. subject to subject knowing is granting its soul and allowing my soul to honor that soul. We both win. Do you understand? I have to respect my own dignity to see the dignity of that. It's only your soul that can operate soul to soul. Do you understand? Your mind won't. Your mind will see, is there money in it? Is she good looking or whatever? It'll always be self-referential. Uh, it's the difference between lust and love. Does that help souls? Yeah, that's great. The essence of a thing. The, yeah. And to preserve and honor the essence of a thing is to be soulful. Yeah. So in your work, I've heard you reference growing up a white Catholic boy from Kansas. <laughs> and later in your spiritual development, you reference liberation theology and how impactful that's oh, been yeah. to your understanding of theology and yes. how it's impacted, how you see the other. Um, what have you learned the most from traditionally marginalized communities, particularly ones that you've personally, as a priest, mm. have loved and served? Let me start with, it won't sound like it's responding to your good question, but since you were uh, smart enough to use the very phrase liberation theology, I would like to say that I believe the whole Bible is liberation theology. And I, I don't like when we try to make a little side course that might be interesting or something like that. If you don't get the liberationist message, starting with the liberation of the slaves in Egypt, I don't think you get the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I really... The, you get it to maintain the status quo, to enslave people into laws of conformity and rituals of conformity. 
you don't liberate very much at all. So after saying that, what did I learn? I think I made my first international trip to preach in 1977. What had happened was in 73, they put a mic in front of me and I, I made 12 sets of cassettes which you've never even seen, I'll bet. But, uh, oh, are you supposed to the cassettes? You, know, you remember, you're older. not that old yeah. or young. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and six on the Old Testament, six on the New Testament. And those went international, especially to English-speaking missionaries who couldn't afford to fly in a retreat master. In the Catholic world, you have to make a retreat a longer period, at least once a year. So because you put together the English the Irish, the New Zealanders, the Australians, the Americans. In any country, the biggest group of missionaries are English-speaking, at least at that time. So I got invited all over the world to give these wonderful retreats, not wonderful because of what I was saying, but what they were teaching me. And I usually come a few days early to visit the jungles or the missions or the safari outposts, whatever they were. What an education that was. And here's, of course, it's going to sound cliche, but I just met so many people who were both humble and loving. <laughs> and even though they operated in a world of scarcity, they didn't operate with a worldview of scarcity. Hmm. I remember in Guatemala one time where we walked for hours through the jungle of this beautiful little encampment and they tell me I'm the padre, so of course they're very impressed that padre has come to town. But within a few moments, and I hope it wasn't just because I was a priest, but because I was a visitor, I heard the squawking of a chicken, and I saw the mother notion to her teenage boy, he's killing a chicken in the backyard. And, you know, so I know I'm going to be talking now for at least two hours as they cook, they feather that chicken. And... As I went on with the talk, I recognized there were no more chickens. And I found out from the when, no, they kill their last chicken for you. Mm. So here, they have every right to operate with scarcity, and they don't. You and I have <laughs> live in this worldview of abundance that there's more than enough. There's always more than enough. It's coming to an end rather quickly right now. But... Uh, we operate, even though with abundance, with a worldview of scarcity. That we've got to save, we've got to hoard, we've got to have savings accounts. I mean, the ads for insurance on the news, I don't know if I watched the wrong channels, but we're just medicines and insurance is about all we advertise in America anymore. <laughs> so it's true. all about preserving the self. And I'm not saying insurance is wrong. Uh, I'm not saying medicine. I'm taking nine pills a day right now. It's, that's why, <laughs> because of the several health issues I have. So I, who am I to complain? It's keeping me alive. But um, what I learned from them was people who had so little but didn't operate out of scarcity the way we do. I mean, they're still trying to make a buck. Of course they are because they got to pay their bills but are just equipped to operate with so much less, and then the big to still be happy. Mm. I remember when Marcos in the Philippines had leveled an entire field of the beautiful little huts that the Filipinos build, you know. And we heard, we mostly work with the poor in the Philippines, and we heard early in the morning that he had done this. So we went out in our brown robes to try to help the people. But we expected to meet wringing of hair and hands and a cursing of Marcos. And it was, they were making jokes. And, and little groups even singing while the others rebuilt the houses, you know. This is a different psyche. I come back to America and all it is is blame and, and accusation and trying to exonerate the self from any responsibility and no taking of responsibility, just that it's not my fault, it's your fault, and so you should take responsibility. Uh, we just don't have 
the large-mindedness or the big-heartedness to deal with suffering, to deal with even inconvenience. And I'm used to comfort, just like you are, but I, I hate to see it in myself, how much I don't like discomfort. Do you understand? <laughs> Ah, I got to turn the air conditioner on right away. Don't want to sweat for a minute <laughs> or the heater or whatever it might be. We've just been so damn spoiled by our ability to adjust the environment that uh, we don't know how to live without and still be happy. And that's what I learned from the developing countries, people who had so much less. And uh, we call that the... The, the advantage of the marginalized, those at the edge of any system, which that I threw out quickly earlier, he is the inclusive savior. We are the included. Let's just start with that. Now, that's a difference not just in quantity, but in quality. I'm not the includer. Now, I do it on my little scale, when I learned to love enemies and people of other races and religions, I, I learned a little bit of inclusion. But he who reconciles all things in heaven and on earth, as Colossians said, that's how he saves us, by including us. So the early fathers, St. Irenaeus and St. Athanasius said, that which is not included is not redeemed. That was which is not in flesh is not redeemed. So, and everything is in flesh, uh, and everything is included, so it's all redeemed. So Jesus, now you probably heard me say in the book, I do believe it's not smart to say glibly, as most of us Christians do, Jesus is God. Literally, theologically, technically, that's not true. The Trinity is God. Yeah. When you take one-third of the wheel out and try to make it stand on its own. And isn't it interesting that even in art, we put Jesus on a throne. He became the father. He became the source. So we, we overplayed, and you know I love Jesus, right? He's still the <laughs> icon of everything. But we overplayed the Jesus card because we weren't Trinitarian, so that's all we could do anymore. And then we had to make him into God. And as I think I say toward the beginning, if we would have spent more time on saying God can be found in all things instead of proving, which we can't do, that Jesus is God, we would have had much greater success in our evangelization of the world, much greater. Our God is the true God. It just made us competitive, you know. Jesus did not walk around claiming it himself. You know that. Mm -hmm. In fact, the term he uses is human one, the human one, every man. He emphasizes his likeness to us. And for some reason, we emphasize his unlikeness to us. So with our dualistic mind, we made Jesus, for all practical purposes, only divine. And we made you and me, for all practical purposes, only human. Missing the major point. The major point is to put those two together. So Jesus is a third something. Not human, not divine, but now your logical mind is going to fall apart now. Fully human and fully divine at the same time. Uh, that's what the early councils insist on. And I, I think they're right. Uh, I, I realized at one point what I had done in my mind was half human, half divine. Mm -hmm. I could fit that together. You understand? But fully it, human. Is Richard Rohr fully human and fully divine? No. Okay. He, he's still growing in his humanity, and he's included in the divinity of the whole. Now, Jesus is the personalization of the divinity of the whole, Christ is the naming of the divinity of the whole, but it's only the whole that is fully divine. I'm not fully divine. Thank God I don't have to live up to that, as I say, because I'm clearly not. <laughs> but come back around. I'd like you to ask it in different ways. For most people, it's crucial. 
But I remember the shock when my professor told me in the late 60s, uh, building our, our Franciscan Christology, one of us asked in the class, well, when did Jesus know he was the Son of God? And he said, I can't prove this, but my assumption would be that was the full grace of the resurrection. But in his 33 years, he lived with a limited mind that was objectively the Son of God, but didn't fully know it. He had to trust, or otherwise he was not like us in every way, as Hebrew says. And now you don't have to believe that, but it, it's, I find it very helpful to believe that Jesus' full humanity somehow limited his full divinity, which is what Philippians 2 is, seems to be saying. Mm. So you and I are both human and divine, but we're not fully human and fully divine. Does, does that help? Mm. Uh, we don't encapsulate the fullness of any yeah. of those realities. Well, to go back Perhaps. to those earlier words, we are the included. We are not the great includer. Uh, that's the Christ. The Christ includes all things in heaven and earth in himself. Although the Christ is beyond gender, so we shouldn't say himself. It's, it's starting to get doctrinal, but those of us who are teachers probably have to get that somewhat correct or the corollaries aren't so good. And the corollaries were not so good, as I said. Jesus became God, and you became uh, only human, not divine. Mm. So what about with the other faiths, like Buddha and Krishna and other avatars of different traditions and religions? Do you, how do you see that in comparison to Jesus? Well, I'm liberated uh, by the Second Vatican Council, that marvelous council of the church, which is higher than the papacy for us, right? An ecumenical council, although we didn't invite too many Protestants, but we, we at least invited the Orthodox. <laughs> I think the Protestants were just observers because you were considered heretics at the beginning of the council, not at the end of the council. That was So we are mandated by our official Catholic teaching to recognize that all who in the other churches are baptized and call themselves Christians are just as much a part of the body of Christ as we are. That's monumental. And that freed us in a lot of ways more than a lot of Protestant denominations because it came from on high. You know, Then it went a step further in the document on non-Christian religions, and it put it this way. You can see how they were voting, I'm sure, to please the conservatives and the liberals. We still would believe that Jesus is the Word of God, but that doesn't mean Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism are not words of God. They are all words of God. So it comes back to the language I like. Jesus is very inclusive in his authentic teaching. But what I hope I say fairly in the book is let's be honest and admit that many Hindus and many Buddhists and many Jews honor the de facto Christ much better than many Christians huh? in loving their neighbor and loving the earth and loving and loving anything. Any loving energy is the energy of Christ. I don't care where it comes from. I don't care the label that the person carries. Did, did you get to the end of the book where I give that marvelous quote from a Jew, Simone Weil? What a oh, woman. Simone Weil, yeah. Yeah, you've heard of her before. Let me just read it in this context. I said, set it apart as an epilogue. You can take my word for it that Greece, Egypt, ancient India, ancient China, the beauty of the world, the pure and authentic reflections of this beauty in art and science, what I have seen of the inner recesses of the human heart, where religious belief is unknown, unbelievers, atheists, all these things have done as much as the visibly Christian ones to deliver me into Christ's hands as his captive. Mm. Oh, my God. God. And you know, she never accepted baptism. 
She was attracted to the Catholic Church as a Jew, but she deliberately said, no, Father, I do not want to be baptized because I want my life to build a bridge between Judaism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And then she was probably killed at Auschwitz or one of the death camps. Talk about a saint. Talk about a Christian. I use, as you know, some of my major examples are Jewish. Anne Frank, Eddie Hillison. There were non-Christians who got the Christian message, starting with Jacob. You were here all the time, and I never knew it, mm -hmm. when he anoints the rock. Are any of you coming to the conference in a few weeks, by any chance? No. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be too expensive to fly out here, but the liturgies we've created are just so powerful. And they start the first night, Thursday night, there's going to be a, a porous rock in the middle of the table. And uh, we're going to anoint it with blessed oil so the rock permeates, I mean, the oil permeates the rock. And let that sit there the whole weekend as the Christ symbol. Because you take the symbol of rock, it just goes all the way through. And, uh, of course, geologists love that. But it's the most rudimentary form of materiality most yeah. of us have ever seen. And it does start with the Jacob story, where he anoints the rock and says, this is Beth El, the house of God. Yeah. Now, by normal Jewish standards, <laughs> that's paganism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's paganism. And yet, it's, and, and where on that very rock, he sees the ladder of the angels going up and down, the transmission place between the eternal and the human. That is a marvelous story. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to read it dramatically the first night. And then they're all going to have a little smaller rock on their circular tables, and they'll anoint. And of course, you know the word Christ is the Greek word for. Messiah, which is Messach, which means the anointed one, the anointed one. Mm -hmm. So all what we're saying in this book is all reality has been anointed since the beginning. It is a Christ-soaked world. And therefore, it would be more correct to say, well, when the cardinal called me the other day, he affirmed this, that Jesus, I know all of our Christmas songs say Jesus came into the world, but he said, you said it correctly. Jesus comes out of the Christ-soaked world. That's why the imagery of the animals, the stable, the manger, the earthiness of the whole birth story. It's God coming out of the earth, not descending from the heavens. Mm -hmm. Can you almost rearrange your mind to try to think that way? It works. At least it works for me. I love the passage where you wrote, I doubt if you can see the image of God in your fellow humans if you cannot first see it in the rudimentary form, in stones and plants and flowers, in strange little animals and bread and wine, and most especially cannot honor the subjective divine image in yourself. But that was a powerful passage. That's the heart of the message. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I loved how you kind of talked about seeing it in the rudimentary forms, yes. the simple forms, as the easiest and primary way of seeing God. And... Almost as like a training wheels situation. Ah, that's perfect. That, that that's helps. Perfect. Eventually helps you love God, your very self. Yeah. And I think you know, so many of us have us have it backwards. We try to love. We did the words, abstractions, and, and creations of human culture, leap. like religion and philosophy, as God. But those things are more complex, more difficult to find God within than a rock. We need to go to kindergarten before we go to first grade. Beautiful, right? <laughs> beautiful. And uh, for many of us, we might need to get out of church buildings on Sundays and find God in the trees and sunlight before we are able to find him, even in bread and wine. But then for others of us, maybe the challenge and invitation might be finding him beyond nature and even within religion. Very fair. And Very within the fair. vaporous Thank thoughts you. of human yes. beings. And it's, yes. I, just, I loved how you put Thank all you. that. Thank yeah. you. See, now there will be those who heard what you just liked and read. They're going to call it pantheism. They're going to call it New Age. Some are going to call it paganism. It's incarnational Christianity. That's all taken to its logical conclusion. And most of us weren't trained in incarnational Christianity. We were trained in spiritual Christianity, what Ken Wilber calls the spirituality of ascent, not descent. 
Ours is a spirituality of descent, which doesn't appeal to the ego, of course, which is why we turned it around. And all this language of perfection and climbing and achieving salvation. And, uh, but you, wouldn't you know an idea this big, a truth this big, would probably take several thousand years to begin to sink in to the human psyche. I think it was just too much. And that doesn't mean those people weren't saved. Uh, they just didn't enjoy it as early, <laughs> really, as you can enjoy it now. You can enjoy it right now. And you don't have to wait till you die. That's the heart of the matter. Hmm. I always say salvation isn't a question of if, it's a question of when. When are you going to wake up? Have you used that? I keep getting back to Ken for his four-part cleaning up, growing yeah. up, waking up, and showing up. Yeah. Groups find that so yeah. helpful. Yeah. But in terms of what we're saying here, my experience is most religions have been at the cleaning up stage. Till the middle of the 20th century, by the gifts of psychology and science, we began to understand growing up. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. I do think there were always people who woke up yeah. in the earlier periods, always. But it was harder for them to do. And what we see in a lot of our Catholic saints is they did have this unitive sense of their radical union with God. But like we find in some of the medieval saints, there'll still be hints of anti-Semitism, you know? So they awakened in one level, but they hadn't grown up. They hadn't had good teaching. And speaking of the charismatic movement, mm -hmm. you know, that's what killed it in my experience. I believe there is such a thing as the baptism in the Spirit, which is a mini Pentecost, a, a true inbreaking into the psyche. But because most of Pentecostalism did not have good theology, good teaching, mm -hmm. it it started to devolve about three years after your baptism experience. Mm -hmm. all, in all denominations. Now, some groups hold on. Let's hype up the group on Friday night and replicate the... Yeah. the and get we the all feeling back. Get the feeling back. But it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And that's, of course, I argue for good theology because without it, you invariably have bad theology, really. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I just think it's interesting that your, your theological progression coming out of Catholicism, liturgy, but not coming out, you're still in it, um, but being rooted in that into having a charismatic experience and then yes. an experience of the universality of all things, which to me feels like that's the, the progression, progression. As it should be, As it I should hope. be, yeah. I hope, but it's all gift. And I was just lucky to be able to be handed the gift in portions so I could handle that a bit. Because, you know, any God experience is hot, mm. and it inflates the ego. Because you think you're so, like it did Judaism. We're the only chosen people. No, you're just chosen enough <laughs> to tell other people that they're chosen too. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, yeah. Uh, and uh, most in any group don't get that. Mm. So we were the one holy, true Catholic Church, even after we'd rejected half of ourselves <laughs> after 1054, we just deny the obvious to maintain our specialness. <laughs> and in all fairness, the Orthodox did the same thing. Yeah, of course. I've had Orthodox walk out when they found out I was a Catholic priest. They couldn't be in the same room. The hatred is so deep. Isn't that sad? Ugh. <laughs> Richard Rohr's had a profound impact on my life. I think one of the only reasons I still have a sense of spirituality is because of discovering him and, and his perspective on life and spirituality. It was only somewhere in the middle of my marriage to my wife with two kids that I was able to really come to terms with the fact that I was gay. And so many times, I felt like I had to choose between the binaries of my spirituality and sexuality. But Richard, I came across you and your work 
um, right in the middle of coming to terms with all of that. And I feel like you gave me a safe space to know that I'm loved and accepted just as I am and that this world is so much more beautiful and grace-filled and hopeful than uh, I ever thought it would be. I didn't feel like I had to give up any parts of myself. I feel like I was able to become whole and really find all of who I was in the midst of all of that. What do you know for sure? It's going to sound too simply said, but I had to fight to believe this for sure, and now I think I do, that all is grace. That all the gaps that our mind creates are filled in by grace. Uh, by undeserved beauty, goodness, truth, if we gaze at them long enough. So what I know for sure is all is grace. And when I see people like Anne Frank able to emerge, how can you not say all is grace? That people can still find freedom and beauty and goodness in horrible circumstances. That grace is available everywhere all the time to fill in all the gaps that our mind can't fill in. And that's the weakness of rationalism. It tries to solve the whole problem on the rational level instead of the gazing level. You know, contemplation just means to gaze at something. To gaze at something till you see it all the way through. So yeah. Everything is grace. Mm -hmm. You said in your book, which maybe is the best definition of grace I've ever seen, grace is just the natural loving flow of things when we allow it instead of resisting it. Mm, thank you for, what for noting that. Said. See, that's, I keep opening this book and I find lines. <laughs> like, wow, what day did you write that? <laughs> Inspired. <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned this is, you feel like this is kind of your life or yeah, something it is. about this. Do you have any hopes for what people, whether the church or I guess, yeah. who are you writing to, and and what mm. what are you hoping that lasts beyond your life with all these thoughts and these yeah. works that you're doing? You've written so much, you've put so much what out into the world. What a beautiful question, which I don't have an answer to. I don't. But what do I hope? <laughs> I think I was writing. This is also a cliche, but to sincere seekers, and hoping there's still some sincere seekers inside the fold of Christianity mm. who are willing to admit they don't have the whole picture yet. Uh, that's why we need knowing balanced with not knowing. If you don't have that not knowing, you, you're not a seeker. You're just a closed-down system that thinks it has mystery in a box, which can never be true. If this could lessen our attachment to a lot of our historical offenses and to just be patient with everybody because we were all trapped in a very small paradigm, all of us. We're all in this thing together. We all got attached to different symbols, different rituals, different flags to salute. And unless we loosen our attachment, how is Jesus ever going to be, as John 4 says, the Savior of the world? Do we really want that? I have to say to many Christians, I don't think you want that. Mm. <laughs> when you never go beyond your own boundaries, you have no Jewish friends, you have no black friends, you have no gay friends, you have no Protestant friends, you're all nice, white, middle-class Catholics, you know. <laughs> this is not saving the world, nor does it have any hope of doing it. So, of course, I interpret that ending of the Gospels where Jesus says, preach the gospel to all nations, telling us to get out of our camps. It wasn't to save them, it was to save ourselves ah. by getting out of our own little uh, non-diversity systems, which we all create. Why is it that humans are so afraid of otherness? It's universal. I haven't gone to a country in the world where it isn't true. So if this offers people an ultimate oneness is the best thing I can offer them. That the oneness supersedes the divisions. Mm -hmm. 
but I know that will be fought as people like their, their divisions. In the chapter on original goodness, I noticed you put believers in quotation marks. And I wonder if what you see... What page is that on? So I can see why I did it. Do you know? <laughs> you don't know? I don't know the <laughs> believers. Sorry, in, I didn't put that on um, the page number. But do you see anything problematic about Christians thinking of themselves primarily in the framework where we are defined by our beliefs? I uh, do. In a, in a different I part do. of the book, you, you said it. You said this, which I think goes to that. You said, in Franciscan theology, truth is always for the sake of love. For the sake of love. And not an absolute end in itself, which too often becomes the worship of an ideology. But I'd just love to hear a little bit more about that. I, and you've mentioned already some of that in this conversation about how in the West, post-Enlightenment especially, we became so focused on trying to figure things out. And, but think of ourselves in terms of the beliefs, and that being the primary uh, way that we categorize ourselves. What, what, what do you see that's problematic about that? You know, beliefs ask so little of you. They really do. I don't know why we think this is a great thing. If we would take most of the time in the New Testament where the word faith is used, if we would put in the word trust, I think it would be much more existential, active, energizing, and changing of the person. Because the word faith became believing in certain mental assertions. Even that Jesus is God or Jesus is human and divine, those could remain at the level of mental assertions. So that's probably why I put the word believers, because I'm not sure what they believe in except <laughs> theories. And I'd much more trust doers, lovers, Let's highlight those two words. And wherever you see creative doing and energizing loving, there you have the Christ. But I think we're all tired of the word, I'm a believer. And we're seeing it abused in our brother and sister Muslims, too, you know, that all of us are infidels. And I think one reason that can hurt so much is, for me as a Catholic, is that's the way we thought about them for most of history, so they're just returning the compliment. But by the grace of the eternal Christ, I think we've been led beyond that, that we can't call anybody infidels because they don't have our vocabulary or our symbol system. And, and first of all, knowing there's so many unbelievers, infidels, in our own midst in the way we understand loving and doing. Yeah. You, you referenced Eddie Hillisum. Oh, and she's a dear. It was really, really beautiful to see how you included her experience and expression of sexuality as part mm. of spiritual practice. Oh, did I? Oh. Yeah. I forget. You I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Okay. So, not necessarily sexual pleasure, but extending no. to pleasure. Can you talk about pleasure being related to spiritual wow. practice? Pleasure perhaps as spiritual practice? Well, you know, if Jesus' primary mm. metaphors for eternity are a wedding banquet, e even a wedding banquet where 150 gallons of wine are brought in at the end of the party, it's very clear we do not have an ascetic, theology or spirituality. We read that into it. See, the, if you stay at the cleaning up stage, the first stage, cleaning up is getting rid of the impure, getting rid of the unworthy, not integrating it. So a theology of pleasure that would be healthy and create healthy people, I think, would be one that can not remain addicted to pleasure, but appreciative of pleasure. Why would that displease God when that's what he wants to give us for all eternity? <laughs> so, oh, pleasure's good later, but it's not good now. That's still at the cleaning up stage. Now, I doubt <laughs> if most Western middle-class people need to be told that, but the trouble is their appreciation of pleasure is not integrated with spiritual delight. And that's what limits it. It's all having a 
five-star meal at a five-star hotel, and that's pleasure. Well, hardly. Because right? mm-hmm. there's no capacity to give deep meaning to that. It'll be over as soon as you leave the five-star hotel or restaurant. So we become almost accustomed to pleasure. That's why I admire your courage in asking the question, because it is a dangerous question. The hedonistic Westerner, who's materialistic to the core, loves things on their surface, not in their substance. The immediate pleasure it gives to them. They say when you open a package, they can prove the pleasure lasts for 10 minutes. And then you slip back into how you were right before you opened the present or the package. I don't know if that's true. But I think it's true in me. Of course, getting gifts is not one of my love signs. Have you all read the love signs? Yes. Uh, people give me gifts, and I really do appreciate their kindness, but it doesn't turn me on that much. It's just not anything I need. So pleasure, I'm hearing you say, is not, not necessarily about leaving something or leaving no. life, but entering more into it or being with There you go, yeah. Thank you for hearing it correctly. Yeah, you know, even the Buddha played this asceticism game. But when Jesus is accused by the Pharisees of not fasting and not washing your hands, we see that Jesus is making it very clear in his lifetime ministry that he was not an ascetic either. He was beyond the cleaning up stage. Mm. Well, we would say he was in the showing up stage. That's the incarnation. I'm showing up in the completed form of what a full human being looks like, what we all should look like. I think I do say that in the book. If we had known that Jesus came and to give us permission to be fully human, and that is to be fully divine. (laughs) So it all comes together. But Mm. we thought he was liberating us to be beyond human. Mm. And we jumped over the growing up stage and the waking up stage in many cases. And so we didn't become very human at all. Carol Hauslander, the one I agree with, she tells a story in that her autobiography, The Rocking Horse Catholic, how uh, she went, this is in the 1930s, to uh, Catholic Mass. At that time, we knelt to receive communion. She's kneeling next to this dear couple who seemed to be overly pious. And at the end of the Mass, she meets him in the vestibule. And she was sort of short and not so good looking and was known as an eccentric in town. And she said they literally turned away from me and would not look at me. And she stopped going to Catholic Church for some time. She says, this isn't working. The transference of receiving the body of Christ and not acting like the body of Christ Mm -hmm. is is the scandal. I think, isn't that every person you know, not every, but most, who've left the Christian religion, don't they have a story like that? They all have a story of hypocrisy. Our, Our ministers and priests who are phonies, and they lose faith in the whole thing. Sad. If I were to ask one more question, it would be this. What is resurrection? What is the Christ metaphor after the death? And here we see this Christ showing up in a different form every time. Um, who is Christ in the resurrection? Mm. And, and what is the resurrection for us? Well, for me, that's all I can say. But I think there's scriptural validation for this and visible validation for this. For me, Resurrection is incarnation taken to its eventual goal. Once all things are seeded in God, the DNA, divine DNA is in everything, then nothing divine can ever die. I mean, so the the resurrection of Jesus is not a one-time anomaly. 
And that was the trouble. We, we limited everything to the body of Jesus. That's what I mean when I say we overplayed the Jesus card. First of all, in the first six centuries, you're not allowed to paint the resurrection. There's not a single attempt to paint the resurrection. So when it does start being painted in the West, it's a lone Jesus stepping out of the tomb. We call him Touchdown Jesus. He's always, look at me, look at me, his hands are up. He's sometimes carrying a white flag which has no message written on it. I looked in art museums all over Europe. There's never a message written on the white flag because I don't think we knew the message of resurrection. Then there's sometimes two stunned guards over here. There's three happy angels over here. That's the West painting of the resurrection. Now, here's the Eastern tradition in one uh, classic form. He's always trampling the gates of hell. Those are the gates of hell there. See the locks and chains? Now, I'm sorry this is not a complete picture, but underneath is Hades all tied up. Hades is not the same as the devil. Hades is the god of the underworld in most ancient, and we got them all uh, conflated and put together as one. This one doesn't show him all tied up. But the important thing is, he is pulling people out of hell, symbolized by Adam and Eve. This is Adam and Eve. And he's always joined up above by a whole bunch of other men and women. Usually half have halos. Yes, this one does. Half have halos and half don't have halos to show both the justified, the pre-justified, and the uh, we're all up there. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a universal message. Uh, the other one, I know this used to be a put down of gay people. I don't think they use it anymore. Limp wristed uh, people mm -hmm. call gay people. Yeah. Well, it's a compliment in these. Every single Eastern painting always has Adam and Eve limp wristed. And, the, you know, when people couldn't read and write, they studied every aspect of a painting. It all had meaning for them. And the limp wrist was supposed to symbolize, I can't pull myself up, I am pulled up. Isn't that good? I mean, it's good theology. It's a good theology of grace. There's always these rays coming out, or the ma mandala pulling everything in to this one. So he's the microcosm of the macrocosm. Mm. And this is consistent. John Dominic Crossan, who's going to be with us in a few weeks at our conference here at the convention center. He and his wife made something like 20 some trips to Syria, Cappadocia, Crete, Cyprus, uh, Egypt, uh, just studying the Eastern painting of the resurrection. And this is the pattern, always. Mm -hmm. So it's a corporate understanding of resurrection. You didn't expect this long an answer, but- I love it. It's, uh, go back to, if incarnation is true, I'm, I'm making everything depend on that, really. That's the linchpin of the whole book, the mystery of incarnation, which is why we Franciscans, we popularize Christmas. You know, before Francis, uh, as it should be, the uh, Holy Week, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday were the big days, you know. But Francis got all excited about the incarnation. And that was reflected then our, in our theology that uh, Christmas is already Easter. If God chose us to become, God loves things by becoming them. Once God does that, the problem is solved. It's okay to be human. It's okay to be earthy. It's okay to be embodied. Uh, we don't need a later blood sacrifice. I want to emphasize the word need. I'm not downplaying the cross, not by any means. And you know that from the book. But as Dun Scotus taught us, why do you need to understand everything in terms of need or necessity? Wow. It's just gift. And I do hear that from so many Christians. They say, let's take a conservative Catholic thing, like going to a priest to have your sins forgiven. We're really not saying that's the only week. But stop seeing it as a need just seeing it as at the right time it's a wonderful gift when you can't convince yourself that you're forgiven an authoritative voice says in the name of god i'm telling you you are forgiven i've been a confessor enough to know 
That is life-changing for many people. But we've got to take all of the aspects of the gospel and understand them as gift, not as necessity. Mm. And Jesus is the supreme gift that summarizes all of these gifts. So I'm glad I didn't intend to tell you about this. But... <laughs> Richard Rohr is one of the biggest influences in my own spirituality. He's taught me about non-dual thinking, how to approach aging, spiral dynamics and the evolution of consciousness, the practical implications of following Jesus, and most important of all, how to get my ego out of the way. My favorite Richard Rohr quote is, we don't think our way into a new way of living. We live our way into a new way of thinking. Thanks, Father Richard, for the gift that you are. He has brought so much freedom into my spiritual life by steering me away from dualistic thinking and judgment and by broadening my scope of the inclusive Christ. You know, I spent most of my life is a really rigid fundamentalist. And sometimes I still have tremendous guilt over the actions I took as a result of my beliefs. And one of those things was when I was teaching Sunday school and people would have, we'd have a time of prayer and prayer requests. I would always feel very annoyed with people who would, have a prayer request about their cat or their dog because this oh, was not a serious no, lady thing. No, that's true. Right? Jesus, we're here to serve Jesus, to share the gospel, to save people from hell. And here you are talking about this Your soulless cat. being, right? <laughs> and then I read the dedication of this book oh, and it took my breath away. Thank you. Thank because you. on the other side of rigid fundamentalism, Last year, we lost a dear friend and family member whose name was Max. He was a blue Weimariner. Oh. And, uh, I know. You know, <laughs> seeing that, how you open the book, that Hal Venus, your black lab. She used to be sitting right here. Yeah. Right. And how Venus revealed Christ to you. I just, I'd love to hear your reflections on the universal Christ as seen. Through Venus. She taught me presence by her ability to be undyingly present to me. And any of you have had a dog, you know that experience. Even in the middle of the night, if I'd get up on a sick call, she would sooner go with me than keep sleeping. You know, <laughs> Nothing was higher than being with me. I mean, there's no doubt about it. She just, ah. The, the earnestness of dogs, I think, is what endears them to. They're eternally earnest and absolutely sincere about the moment. Let's do it. <laughs> Even when she was dying, but then I could finally get, I think I talk about the look in her eyes. She just, I'd look across the room and she'd just be holding my gaze. And I don't know how she communicated it, but I said, I think she's in pain. And she's trying to tell me, now is the time. Oh, that was horrible to accept that. One night I had to get up with her and she started groaning. I knew she was in pain. And I sort of just, well, not sort of, spent the rest of the night on the floor with her. Animals have an ability to communicate thisness, nowness, enoughness, that they get so excited about nothing. <laughs> uh, and to hold your gaze, she could hold my gaze much longer than I, I would eventually tire. And, well, I got some work to do. Let's stop this look of adoration at one another. Uh, so the point I hope I make in the book is anything that elicits the flow out of you, toward it, the object doesn't matter. If it's a lizard, it's okay. If it's a leaf, a tree, anything that starts the flow of delight and appreciation, that is contemplation. And that object is operating as Christ for you. Mm. I mean, I'm glad we can end on that because that, 
That real, and I'm glad you noticed the, the dedication. I'm making my major point already in the dedication. Huh? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a golden tabernacle, as a Catholic might think. It's what elicits surrender, awe, love, response from you. That is Christ for you. Um, it works. It creates very content people who are never lonely again, as I say at the end of the book, and people who, um, who aren't competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to compete for, even holiness. I don't, like, I bet I was like you. What are you on the Enneagram? I'm a nine. Oh, that was your one wing. It was. See, that's what I am. We ones are so prone to that, to being zealous and righteous. Yeah, and, and we've, a lot of ministers are ones because mm. you're attracted to this idealistic, visionary thing and you don't realize how you are central. Your righteousness is central to the whole thing. Yeah, that's why I think much of this learning that I've tried to communicate in my books for me was necessary to get out of that early trap of perfectionism, zealotry. I'm sure I was never openly unkind to anybody. It was worse